Okay, so this is lecture 15 of ECE 503. So in this lecture, what we're going to be looking at is we're going to start off the important topic of something called the discrete Fourier transform. So um, just like the laundry list that I have shown here. So we've looked at continuous time Fourier series. We looked at continuous time Fourier transforms. We looked at discrete time Fourier series and discrete time Fourier transforms. We looked at Z transforms and then you know, we haven't looked at these things like, for instance, Laplace transforms. That's, we, we don't touch that sort of thing here, right? But um, there's some issues. There, like, for instance, the motivation behind this course is that we use digital microprocessors in order to handle signal information in a digital manner. Because we looked at, remember when we talked about this, you know, you can definitely design a circuit, use resistors and capacitors and inductors and other sort of analog components in order to do some sort of signal processing on continuous signals, right? But is it cost effective? Is it, can you do it in a timely manner? Will it get the desired result? And the answer is it depends, right? But most of us, perhaps we're not the um, you know, analog circuit guru or grandmaster, but we can definitely program microprocessor systems. At the very least, we can dump something into MATLAB, play it there, and then put it back into the analog domain, right? Now, the problem is MATLAB, for instance, as one example, but anything on a computer platform, it's got to be digital, right? So we get, let's say, a time domain signal, a continuous time domain signal, sample it, becomes discrete time. Perhaps we then quantize the amplitude values. We get a digital signal. We put it into the computer. We use software like C, like C++, like MATLAB or Simulink, and then we process it. Sometimes, like I'm not sure about you guys, but with myself, I love to play in the frequency domain. I see the world in frequency. Right? The problem is, if we try and convert these signals into the frequency domain, can you do that with the discrete time Fourier transform? Absolutely not. Can you, do, can you represent any of these signals, like a discrete time signal, in terms of a discrete like, uh, frequency response? And the, amps, the answer is you can't. Right? Remember that a DTFT in the frequency domain is continuous. It's a continuum of frequency values. And unfortunately, our microprocessor systems don't handle that very well. We can approximate it, but rather, I want to come up with an intelligent way where if I have a discrete or digital time domain signal, I'll also have a discrete or digital frequency representation as well that is accurate and gives me information about that signal. That's where the, DT, that's where the DFT comes in. So the DFT is almost like the DTFT, but it has a digital frequency representation too. So actually, I'm going to cut ahead. Oh, there we go. So a DFT, uh, sorry, DTFT would produce, in the frequency domain, it will produce this sort of magnitude, huh, magnitude n phase response, right? Can MATLAB or your computers or your Raspberry Pis or your ARM Cortexes or any of those handle a continuous frequency response? The answer is no. Or you have to discretize it like crazy. But if you use the DFT, what you get is an intelligent way of making it discrete, right? So this slide, slide six, so I cut, a, I cut ahead. I didn't want to go through the mathematics until you see what I want to do. I don't, in, in my computer, I don't want to handle the top two graphs. I rather opt for the middle two, these two guys here, because those can be handled using a computer, can be handled using an embedded processor, can be handled using an FPGA or a DSP. Now let's go back into figuring out how we get that. Okay. So here's the recipe for getting a discrete Fourier transform from a DTFT. 
Step one, okay? Get pepper. No, just kidding. So what you do is you get this representation. So we know that this guy here is our DTFT. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull a few tricks. First of all, I'm going to frequency sample that DTFT representation. I'm going to essentially say that I'm going to discard everything except for omega equal to 2 pi k over n. Right? Step one. So we know what n is. n is some sort of periodicity. And k is some frequency index. So little n is our discrete time index. Little k is our discrete frequency index. And big N is the period of the frequency representation. Because we know that in the frequency domain, our, um, our like, you know, discrete time Fourier transform will produce periodic replicas of the spectra. Right? And when we discretize it, we'll have periodic replica of discrete, discrete discretize spectra. That's what n is. n is the period of those discrete spectra. So we plug that in to both sides, left-hand side and right-hand side. And we know that this is periodic. Okay? This should not be a surprise. Anyone who's surprised? No. No. Just good. So now what we do is we break down the summation. What we now do is we have an infinite number of summations and each summation sums across big N samples. That's good. So here's a replica. We're summing all N samples of that replica. Here's another replica right next to it. Sum all N replica. Here's another replica. So what I'm doing is every N samples I sum, and then I sum all of them together. It's identical to two. But there's a method behind my madness here. So what I'm doing is I'm setting this up because what I'm going to show ultimately is another way of representing. We're going to get the DFT representation through this mathematical manipulation. So what I'm doing is I now have summations of n samples at a time, and then I'm summing all, all of them together. So it's equivalent to this guy here. And then so, in other words, what I'm doing is I'm taking this, this guy here is my n samples at a time being summed together. And what L is, is essentially some sort of shifting. So I shift by one, take n samples. Shift by another one, take n samples sum. Shift by another one. So L is some sort of shift. It's an index of saying, I'm now looking at this replica, this replica, this replica, this replica in frequency. And I'm going to rewrite it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this guy. So instead of having before, I had this guy. So n is equal to ln, and then uh, all the way to ln plus n minus 1. And then we have x of n and stuff. What I'm going to do instead is, first of all, I'm going to move the l in and I'm going to move the n out. And you might say, oh, can I do that? Yes, I can, because what I'm going to do is I'm also going to, instead, instead of shifting the summation, I'm instead going to shift x. I'm going to keep the range of points that I'm going to sum in the same location. n is from uh, n equals 0 to big N minus 1. But what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to take x of n, and I'm going to shift that across the summation range. So I can either do one of the, ah, come on, behave. So what I'm going to do is I can either do I can either do the following. So let's say those are all my samples, and I can say take n of these and sum, then shift my summation range, and then take n of these guys and sum, take n of these guys and sum, take n of these guys and sum, and continue. 
continue on from minus infinity to infinity. Or what I can do is I can keep my summation of n samples the same location, and I can move my x of n here, I can move it either left or right by n samples at a time, right? So it's almost like the changing of the light bulb or whatever. So you can either, um, um, you know, it's all about frame of reference, right? So you can either have, uh, you know, you hold the light bulb and nine people below are turning the ladder, or you're holding the light bulb and there's a few hundred people turning the house around the light bulb or whatever. So in this case, what we're doing is we keep the summation range in the exact same location, but we're actually shifting x of n by L samples at a time, and sum, 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 sum. Or, we can do the top version, which is keep x constant in the same location, and move our summation range across it. So it's either one way or another, it gets us the same result. The reason why I'm doing this is it's going to help us mathematically. Discard. And so what it's going to do is, we're going to, we, recal we recalculate it. Now we have this thing called xn minus ln. So that's that shifting, that moving around, either to the left or right, of those x samples, right? And we're going to call this summation of xn minus ln, we're going to call it xp of n. And it turns out that this guy is periodic. This guy here is periodic. So what we want to do is, because he's periodic, what do we know about periodic waveforms? We can find out what the Fourier series is of it. So that's, a little, that's another trick I'm going to pull. What I'm going to do is, I know that xp of n is equal to the Fourier series equation. The, uh, uh, in this case, uh, k is equal to 0 to n minus 1, one period. C k e to the j 2 pi k n divided by n. I also know what the Fourier coefficients equation is as well. What I can do is I can now take that discrete time Fourier series expression and plug it in to that expression in step four. And if I do that, what I now have is, so if I take this guy and I take these guys, what I get is the Fourier series coefficient is now equal to this guy. And that, that's, that's totally cool because notice, look at the form. This looks identical to that guy. So it turns out that the Fourier series coefficient is actually equal to x 2 pi over nk, 1 over n, and then x of p of n, by, uh, like, you know, again, by association, is equal to this guy here. This is actually really powerful because now we know that this x p of n is equal to 1 over n, k is equal to 0 to n minus 1, x 2 pi n k, e to the j 2 pi k n over n. n, n ranges from 0 to n minus 1. And with a little bit more mathematical manipulation, what we get at the end of the day, we get the analysis and th synthesis equations for the discrete Fourier transform. So at the end, all that mathematical representation shows us is that all we need is one period of the frequency domain, right? And we also have, at the same time, if we have x of n, we're evaluating it from 0 to n minus 1. So, so what we've got is everything is now digital in both the time and the frequency domain. And this is how we get our frequency representation that's digital from a time domain representation that's digital. This is very, very powerful. Because if you wonder, this is actually what MATLAB, this is what your computer is doing. Whenever you're playing in the time domain or in the frequency domain, this is what it's doing. It's not doing DTFTs, it's not doing CTFTs, it's not doing DTFSs or CTFSs. It is doing this. Okay? Yes? You're jumping ahead. You're jumping ahead, but that's a great question. So the difference between this and a fast Fourier transform is that there is no difference. Fast Fourier transform is a very efficient implementation of the DTF, uh, DFT. 
So, and, and then there are a variety of different FFTs. So what we'll be looking at in a few lectures from now is how do we create an FFT? So an FFT is sort of the streamlined, super computationally friendly version of this. And there will be something called a, a FFT butterfly, where you're going to have like this structure where you can create a lattice of these things, and it will use a low number of resources, and it will compute it in a rather efficient manner. Especially if you have conditions like if you have um, a, an FFT that is radix 2. If th that means that you have base 2 number of inputs and base 2 number of outputs, under certain conditions, that's going to operate really computationally efficiently. So that's a great question. OK. So this is the analysis and synthesis equations of the DFT. So this guy here, if you have a time domain function, uh, so an input, like a x of n. So this is our discrete time signal. What you get is big X usually signifies that it's a frequency representation, and K is our frequency index. This is our frequency representation, and then vice versa. That's our in, in inverse discrete Fourier transform. And so what ends up happening is, using that, we get beautiful patterns such as this. So whenever we have the DTFT, we have you know, continuous frequency representation. Using the DFT, using the formulation that we've just sort of glo glossed over, but the logic of now discretizing, sampling, if you will, the frequency representation, we get these two guys here. That's what your computer can handle, right? So for instance, if you play in MATLAB, so let's say my software-defined radio class again, the spectra, the frequency representation of the wireless environment around them is actually this, just that MATLAB doesn't actually show sample, 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 sample. It looks like it blends everything together, looks continuous, but it's actually discrete like that. There's some shorthand that you, all of you should be aware of in terms of the um, uh, discrete Fourier transform. And this is the big one, is W. Okay? So remember we had like Z transforms, and Z is equal to E to the J, R, actually R E to the J omega, right? What happens is if you do DFTs day in, day out, your hand's going to hurt after a while because you're going to say, OK, e to the minus j, uh, uh, j 2 pi over n, blah, blah, blah. And oh, now here's another e to the minus j 2 pi over n. And oh, e to the minus j 2 pi over n. So if you're writing, let's say if you're doing a class test, if you're drafting a design that has hundreds of these, anything, it's going to be really slow writing all that level of detail. So when people play with DFTs, the shorthand is WN. So when you see WN right away in your mind, you should say, oh, that's equal to E to the J 2 pi over N. Sorry, minus. Thank you. And so where does that come in? For instance, let's say you come up with something like this, this guy here. So this is a, a it's kind of, it's a little bit confusing. So this is a matrix of all these individual WN terms, right? Wn, Wn squared, Wn minus 1, and so on and so forth. So this guy here, as we'll see in a little bit, this is actually when you multiply this matrix on this vector of x of n values. So that's little x0, little x1, little x2, little x3, all the way to little x minus 1. And you multiply that with this matrix it will actually produce the frequency value. It turns out that the DFT can be obtained from, uh, of, like the DFT of a time domain vector can produce a frequency domain vector through this matrix operation. That's a really powerful result. So instead of doing funny little integrals, like contour integrals, like in the case of Z transforms, or like lots of summations to infinity, or anything like that, in the case of DFT, it's a matrix multiplication. And this matrix has a very special name. It's called the Vandermonde matrix. Okay? So its structure consists of these, this kind of like logical pattern of these WNs and squared versions. And, you know, so WNs of different powers uh, distributed 
are both horizontally and vertically. So it has this very predictable pattern, right? And if you multiply it against a time domain vector, you get its frequency domain representation. It's very powerful stuff. So, like, how would you use this? So, okay, so this is maybe a good question. Because if you're going to do this in MATLAB, you might say, okay, how do I do this? Okay. So what happens is, usually, if we have a time domain signal, so let's say I have n points. So let's say I have n points of a DT signal. So that's my x0, x1, x2, xn minus 1. So what I'm interested in is figuring out, OK, how does the frequency response of this look like? Right? So what I want to do is I want to apply the DFT on that in order to get big x0, big x1, big x2, all the way to big x n minus 1, right? Because from that, I can understand here what the frequency characteristics are of the time domain signal x of n, right? So what I would want to do is I would take this, this x guy here. So let's say we call it little x n. And what I would do is I would take little x n, and I would multiply it by the van der Maan matrix, OK? So in the van der Maan matrix, we saw what the structure looked like, right? So the structure is 1, 1, 1, 1, and then 1, 1. And then we would have this, then we would have this, then we would have, uh, yeah, cube, all the way to, and then here would be this, all the way to, and so on, right? Until we get Wn, right? So this would be our van der Maan matrix. And so all you would do is you would just need to do the multiplication of that vector with that matrix, and then you can get your frequency response of that vector. So this is, and so whenever we talk about, let's say, DFTs, usually here's something called endpoint DFTs. And what that means is that's the number of time domain samples that go into the DFT in order to produce n frequency samples of that same time domain response, right? And the same thing with FFTs. So you hear endpoint FFTs, it's the same thing. The reason why van der Maan matrix sticks in my mind is that, that during my PhD studies and my qualifying exam, that was one of the questions. They say, um, what type of matrix is this? Van der Maan matrix. You know, so that's why I'm, it, it, it's quite vivid. All right. OK. So, that, so that's, how you would, that's how you would use a van der Maan matrix. You would basically do a matrix multiplication. Uh, in reality, you would use um, an FFT, which we will talk about in the next lecture. <laughs> OK. And so actually, rem this is another very interesting point. If you want to find the inverse discrete Fourier transform, you just take the inverse of the van der Maan matrix, multiply against your frequency response, and you get. Good question. Um, I don't remember. I think it's something probably very easy. I think it's complex conjugate. I should look into that. That's a good question. But, but if you take the inverse of the van der Maan matrix, and I think it's something really simple. I just can't think about it right now. What happens is if you take that inverse, it might be conjugate transpose. It's conjugate transpose? OK. So, so uh, the inverse of the van der Maan matrix would be the conjugate transpose. I'll double check, but I think it's that, because it's something really, really simple. It's not like, oh, I have to do now matrix inverses. Ah! It's so take the transpose, conjugate, and then multiply by your frequency response. You will get your time domain information back. All right? So with that, here's an example. And this is another one that's like with actual numbers. So let's say you have a time domain signal 0, 1, 2, 3. And I want to find out what the DFT of that is. I would then find out what the van der Maan matrix is. In this case, you get 1s, minus 1s, j's, and minus j's. You would multiply it against that vector 
And at the end of the day, you would get the frequency response that's pretty much complex numbers. It would be 6 minus 2, and then a few complex values as well. So what I would re recommend you do is, in MATLAB, just have fun with it. Like, you know, create a Vandemon matrix. I think there is an actual function called Vandemon that would generate a matrix of any size. So you don't have to manually type every element of this matrix. Multiply it against a time domain vector, and then it will produce a frequency domain vector. And then you can try out things like take the magnitude and also phase responses and plot them using the plot command, and you'll see what the frequency response looks like. One thing that you might want wonder, how would a four-point, a, a sort of a four-value time domain signal, what would be its resolution to frequency domain? It'll be four points. And it doesn't look nice, huh? Like what happens? Like so, you'll have the frequency response. It'll look like this jagged-looking thing. Bless you. But what happens is usually when we play with frequent, like you know, we have time domain signals and we want to see what the frequency characteristics look like, we usually want to choose n to be very big. We usually want n to be 512, uh, 10, uh, 1024, 4096. We want to choose, because what happens is this provides us with additional frequency resolution. So we can actually see very interesting characteristics. Maybe there are nulls or um, curvatures in the frequency response that might reveal more interesting information about that signal. So in order to do that, we need more time domain signals, let's say 4096 time domain signals. We pass it through a 4096 point DFT, which would mean a 4096 by 4096 Vandemon matrix multiplied to two together, and that will give us our frequency response. So how would this look like? If we have a four point DFT, we would still have frequency characterization from minus pi to pi, but it's four points, so it looks rather jagged. But if we have 4096 points, same range, minus pi to pi, will have beautiful resolution in the frequency domain, right? All right. Okay. So what we're going to do, we're going to wrap up, is the next few slides kind of describe, just like with everything else. So if you have your course textbook, you know, Proacus and Manilacus, there is yet another table that you should put a little sticky next to. So I think, I forgot which student. I think, uh, like, earlier today, I, um, I think I saw, like, you know, here's this D the DST te DSP textbook, and there was, like, a hundred stickies with little labels and stuff. So very diligent. I know who that person is. And that's absolutely fantastic. So here's one more sticky. And so uh, the properties of the DFT. So we saw, so okay, so notation-wise, oh, come on, behave. So we saw, like, whenever I talk about, like, pairs, pairs of information. So let's say I have x of t, and then I have x of f. You know, I use a squiggly f to represent Fourier transform pair, right? Um, if, let's say, it's n, and z, that's a z transform pair, and I usually use a squiggly z. We haven't talked about this, but let's say I have x of t, and then I have big X of s. That's a Laplace transform pair, and we use squiggly l. Here, with the DFT, I don't have a representative character. So notation, if I do x of n, little x of n, and I get big X of k, what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide two bits of information in this notation. First of all, I'm going to say, yes, this is a DFT transform pair. So I'm going to indicate with DFT. No squiggly characters, unfortunately. And I'm going to describe the period. I'm going to say, this is going to be an endpoint DFT. I'm going to say how, many, how big N is. We don't see that with any of these other guys. So here, we actually have to specify, because the choice of N will result in a very different answer and very different frequency resolution. Right? So, given that, oh, come on, behave. Somehow this computer is really sluggish. Boop. So, the first one is periodicity. And periodicity, we know that if, because we know that our, um, our x of n, the way we set it up, we're only sampling from 0 to n minus 1, and then it's periodic after that. What happens is, assuming that if our time, time domain signal is periodic, uh, 
it also turns out that our frequency representation will also be periodic by the same amount. Linearity, just like with a lot of these other operators, uh, DFTs are also linear operators. So the same properties apply. So you're going to have, let, let's say, if we have x1 of n, and we have x2 of n, and they have the respective DFT representations, that if we linearly combine them and weigh them, that their frequency response will be also the same linear combination and same weighting as well. Okay? There is also something that we did not see before. And it's something called circular symmetry. This is actually a really powerful property for a DFT. What this means is that because our x of n and our x of k are, uh, have this periodic property, what happens is, depending on where we start taking the DFT, um, this will also yield kind of some very interesting results as with the frequency response. So for instance, suppose we have x of n, and remember that x of n creates an xp of n over here, right? What happens is, if now we shift things by, let's say, 2, what ends up happening is, notice that if we now return back to that x of n, we get something called x of n prime, we actually rotate those four samples by 2 as well, right? So what we've done is, remember with the derivation for the DFT, when we created that periodic uh, signal, x of p, and we now shift it by 2 and then take those four samples in the middle, we actually get the four samples rotated by a factor of 2. And we use this diagram here in order to show how we have the same four samples, but they're just reordered. Like, no, let me take it back. They're not reordered, but they're rotated through. So two samples are moved to the right, and those two samples that are bumped out are shifted back into the left. Right? And so that this diagram here, these two sort of circles say that we have sample one, oh, sample one, two, three, four, and depending on where our starting point is, we have the same four samples, but they will appear in a different order. We also have, just like before, things of odd symmetry and even symmetry. Uh, and then we talked about real valued, real and even sequences, real and odd sequences. And that's very similar to our discussion with DTFTs. So if we have real and odd and real and even, we either are going to have like cosine functions instead of complex exponentials, or um, J sine rather than um, complex exponentials. So it's really what this does is, based on Euler's relationship, um, we can manipulate that complex exponential to either be a cosine or a sine, depending if our function is real and odd or real and even or a combination thereof. And then, of course, purely imaginary, which is my favorite. So, um, and then there's also the discussion of, like, you know, uh, depending on whether you have real, even, real, odd, um, and, and, and all those mix, mix matches, there's actually a relationship that exists between the time domain and the frequency domain. So if you have a, um, a time domain signal and you have in it, you have a real even component, you have a real odd component, you have an imaginary even, an imaginary odd, what happens is they actually translate according to this sort of mesh in the frequency domain, you have the real even becomes a real even in the frequency domain, but the real odd now becomes the imaginary odd in the frequency domain, and vice versa. The odd imaginary now becomes the odd real in the frequency domain, and then these guys, the imaginary even uh, stays the same in both the frequency and the time domains. So it's kind of, there's a switcheroo between odd real and odd um, odd imaginary, but otherwise everyone stays the same with respect to the even. Now, there's one other thing. So we never talked about this before. We talked about convolution and how evil it is. No, just kidding. It's not evil. But what happens is there's something called circular convolution. And again, notice how we have x of n, and it just, we just rotate through it because it's a periodic signal, that xp of n signal, right? So now, circular convolution, what it does is, if we continuously convolve a signal with another, we're just going to get the same output, same output, same output, same output. So 
what happens is depending on where we're convolving, we're going to get the same answer at some point that's also going to be shifted. So we use a notation here. So, so what we have is this thing here, notice that we have this big N, which indicates that at some point, when we go out of scope of N, we're actually going to re-enter the signal from the other end. What we end up getting is that circular convolution property. Okay? Now, uh, there's a few other properties, um, things like time reversal of a sequence, uh, circular time shift, circular uh, frequency shift, and, and all of these are essentially take advantage of the fact that we have a periodic waveform that just repeats, repeats, repeats uh, every n samples. And so when we have this type of repetition, what ends up happening is we have some very unique mathematical properties which you will not find with the DTFT, which you will not find with any of the other transforms that we have been exposed to. Okay? So part of the homework assignment or problem set that I have assigned will, will sort of test everyone's knowledge with respect to handling this sort of thing. Okay? Okay, and then finally, part, you know, we would not have a complete lecture if we did not talk about Parseval's theorem. You know, like, you know, seriously. So, in this case, Parseval's theorem is, again, the relationship between computing the power in the time domain and computing the power in the frequency domain. And it's almost exactly the same, um, between, um, except that um, here we have a summation of our signal um, that's multiplied, like, you know, x of n multiplied with the conjugate of y of n, and here's just the same thing, except that it's a frequency representation of the two. So the ETFS, the exercise for the student is, put a sticky note in your textbook for table 7.1 and 7.2, because let's say you do a class test, or you use your textbook later as a reference, and you say, what's that DTF, D, DFT property that I need, that, that D, DFT transform pair? Just find it, find it there. All right. So with that, um, that concludes lecture 15 of, um, of ECE um, uh, 503. All right. Oh, come on. Wow, this computer's either that or it's the mouse. Okay. So, okay, so in a nutshell, what we've done is we've finished